Chapter 89 Acquiring Milk The purebreed vampires worshipping Harry Ashukaka, the evil god of joyful life, had gathered in a room illuminated by the beautiful moonlight streaming in through the windows. However, one of the three chairs was empty. Good grief, things have been far too noisy as of late. Don't you think so, Gubberman? The most disagreeable thing for me is being called out here by you, however, Burkine. At a table that should have seated three people, Burkine, who resembled a young nobleman, faced Gubberman, who resembled an evil, elderly mage. Please don't be in such a foul mood, said Burkine. The collection you love so much won't mind you leaving for a little while. More importantly, it would be best to deal with the matter that we have been discussing. If we are not careful, we will lose our balance. The matter that Burkine was referring to was the information leak by the guild master of Nineland's Mages Guild, Kinarp, and his subordinates. Thanks to their information, damage had of course been done to Ternicia's faction who had been making deals with Kinarp, but the damage suffered by Burkine and government's subordinates and those cooperating with them couldn't be ignored either. The vampires had placed their roots deep in the Amid Empire, but their venomous fangs had been planted just as deep in the Orbom Kingdom. The purebreed vampires had existed since a hundred thousand years ago. They knew from experience that if all of their influence was gathered in one country, they would be burned if that country was to fall to ruin. In an era where two great nations existed, they would extend their reach into both nations. That was why it was painful that those who had infiltrated the Orbom Kingdom were being hunted down. Lose our balance? Gubberman repeated, and then his wrinkled face twisted as he let out a cackle. When did you groan so faint-hearted, Burkine? No matter how many of our subordinates and those working with them are hunted down, it is impossible for us to be at risk, he said. If we leave them to be hunted down, those humans will eventually be satisfied. There will be none who can reach us, and even if there are, we simply need to kill them. There was some truth to his words. No matter how many of their subordinates were exterminated, the darkness enshrouding the vampires was deep. If blessed with incredible fortune, the humans might be able to play with the vampire society's tale. It was absolutely impossible for them to reach the purebreed vampires at the head of the society. And even if there were some heroes among heroes who managed to reach them, the purebreed vampires would simply turn on them and kill them. If the purebreed vampires were on their own, it was possible that they could be defeated by an A-class adventurer party, an S-class adventurer or an S-class adventurer backed up by several A-class adventurers. But they were not on their own. The purebreed vampires normally competed against each other pointlessly, but they had made a pledge that they would work together to stand against mutual enemies attacking from the outside. Thanks to that, they had even managed to escape when they were attacked 90,000 years ago by heroes with the divine blessings of Bellwood and Nine Road, who had become heroic gods. Five thousand years after that, they had emerged victorious in a battle against purebreed vampires who worshipped a different evil god. They had been able to overcome many other dangers after that as well. The fact that the faction that worshipped the evil god of joyful life hadn't fallen apart, and the fact that it was now managed in a parliamentary system by the three purebreed vampires, were all because of those experiences. No mutual enemies had appeared during the past fifty thousand years, however. That was why Gubberman's words were correct. If the three purebreed vampires worked together, it was likely that they would even be able to defeat the Orbom Kingdom's entire army. If the five colored blades were included, things would be a little more difficult, but the result wouldn't change. Their subordinates would likely perish, but they would simply need to make more afterwards. Even the noble-born vampires were nothing more than easily replaced pawns. They would simply need to survive and rebuild their influence in a new darkness. As long as the three purebreed vampires survived, they could rebuild their society. That is indeed true, Burkine said in agreement. No matter how bad things become, there will never be any danger to us. But it is problematic for us to lose too many subordinates and those working with them, isn't it? 
We live long lives, so daily enrichment is essential for us. Isn't that right, Gubbaman? Hmm. Now that Burkine was saying this to him, even Gubbaman had to think about making a move. It was true that he was a powerful being, but in order to perfect his collection of undead made from the corpses of heroes, his efforts alone were not enough. He needed many eyes and ears to gain information and many hands and feet to work on his behalf. But what do you specifically have in mind? Gubbaman asked. The information has already been leaked, and it is too late to erase those who know of it. Even if you wanted to have our subordinates disappear. That's right, that Chipra's fellow under Ternitia was defeated as well. Are you planning to make it appear as if all of this was his doing? And Burkine, when will Ternitia be here? Ah, Ternitia won't be coming, Burkine told him. What? That little girl, she has stood us up after I have made the effort of coming out here? No, Gubbaman. I never invited Ternitia here. The only one I called here is you. What? What are you playing at, Burkine? It couldn't be. Burkine gave Gubbaman a gentle expression as he spoke his next words. This incident was caused by Ternitia's failure. Was Burkine going to proposing to Gubbaman that they should feed Ternitia to the humans? Their sworn ally of a hundred thousand years? Gubbaman's eyes opened so wide in surprise that it looked as if they would fall from their sockets, but he quickly saw Burkine's real intentions and twisted his mouth in a smile as he laughed. I see. You intend to weaken Ternitia by throwing her to the humans, and then judge her? In terms of pure strength in battle, Ternitia's was the greatest. However, Burkine had a trump card that he held in reserve. It was a trump card that forced others to obey him. It was powerful but risky, despite having lived for a mind-boggling number of years, he had only used it a few times in the past. Even if not using it would place his life at risk, he had to be careful in using it. That was the kind of trump card it was. But if there was someone equally powerful to him but weakened to the point of being unable to resist, that would be a time to take a great risk but use this trump card to gain a tremendous return. Ternitia is responsible for this incident, said Burkine. Isn't it only natural for her to take responsibility? I suppose that is one way of thinking about it, said Gubbaman. It was the human that Ternitia was using as a subordinate who leaked the information, after all. Yes, and she did something to the tunnel connecting Talashim to the Hartner Duchy, Burkine added. What? That is the first time I am hearing of this, what are you talking about? asked Gubbaman. The purebreed vampires who worshipped an evil god had sent numerous subordinates to the Hartner Duchy, which was adjacent to the new national border of the Amid Empire. Ternitia had put a considerable amount of her strength into this, but Burkine and Gubbaman had dispatched several of their subordinates there as well. Actually, the adventurers called the Five Colored Blades, the ones who are mainly responsible for hunting down Ternitia's subordinates, are doing something interesting, said Burkine. It seems that they are looking for Eleonora. Through those subordinates, Burkine had heard of the movements of Heinz and his party. Eleonora, you say? That cannot be, how are they, people who are in the Orbom kingdom, searching for a traitor who should be on the other side of the mountain range? Could it be, she was there? When the castle sank and the demon king's seal was removed. Then the fragment of the demon king is in that little girl's hands? Gubbaman was visibly agitated. No, that is not the case, said Burkine, flatly denying that possibility. I am her former owner, after all. I know the limits of her strength. No matter how much more powerful she has grown over the past year, she would be immediately consumed by the Demon King's fragment. If she was the one who removed the Demon King's seal, then she would have been seen rampaging like a beast in Nine Land. The one who removed the seal was. Eleonora's current master. Her current master? That damper. 
to think that he has already emerged, so was he behind the incident with Kinarp as well? asked Gubbelman. Most probably, Burkine replied. Eleonora's charming demon eyes only work when eye contact is maintained, so he likely used some other method, however. There were also the incident of a dungeon appearing in the city of Niarchy and the incident where the slave-run mine had turned into a den of skeletons and the mine itself had become an empty plot of land. Burkine and Gubbelman suspected that Vandalieu had been involved in these incidents as well. They couldn't imagine what his intentions had been in doing these, however. People measure others by their own standards. In that regard, Burkine and Gubbelman were very much like people. They would never have been able to imagine that Vandalieu had wanted to register as an adventurer, that he had investigated the relatives of the undead that they treated as pieces of their collection, or that he had caused this series of events as a result of that investigation. The purebreed vampires had concluded that Vandalieu had been after the Demon King's fragment, and that this series of events had been for that purpose. He had undoubtedly released the Demon King's fragments in the southern region of the continent or sought out evil gods other than Hiryashukaka in order to gain information. It could even be that there had been a sealed fragment of the Demon King near the slave-run mine that Burkine and Gubbelman didn't know about. And hadn't Ternicia actually known about all of this? Burkine suspected that she was already communicating with Vandalieu. Her subordinates had suffered the greatest losses, but it seemed likely that this was all part of the masquerade. Burkine felt this distressed because he had his own plans to make a deal with Vandalieu and turn him into an ally. Perhaps if the purebreed vampires had spent a hundred thousand years building bonds like a blood-related family, then things would be different, but they were currently bound only by their common interests, the trust between them was brittle. If one crack formed in that trust, there would be no preventing it from falling into pieces. I see. The one who destroyed the tunnel was Ternicia, wasn't it? If they are plotting something, it makes sense to make Ternicia take the blame, said Gubbelman. That's how it is, now then, let us get to the main topic of discussion, Gubbelman, said Burkine. The Hartner Duchy was suffering from the economic recession caused by the Sauron Duchy being occupied by the Amid Empire, but with the recent accident that had caused the castle to sink, the people had been worried that taxes would increase to pay for the castle's repair or the construction of a new castle. Of course, the repair or rebuilding of the castle would be a public project, so there would be opportunities for business as well. However, those who planted crops and ran dairy farms as their main occupations would not receive the benefits of this. A married couple who had barely been able to make a living working a small field were having a discussion late at night while their only son was asleep. If the taxes go any higher, we won't have any choice but to sell Tom. Please wait, dear. He's only five years old, if we sell him, he'll be sent to the mines. It was incredibly common for boys too young to be used for physical labor to be sent to places where they would be worked to death, such as the mines. The wife was trying to stop her husband from sentencing their son to such a fate after she had gone through the pain of giving birth to him, but it wasn't as if the husband was willing to sell his own child either. His face crumpled as he spoke again. But at this rate, even if we feed ourselves on seeds and strangle every single one of our goats, we won't make it through the winter. Rather than have our whole family starve to death, we have to gamble on the choice that gives us at least a little more hope. You know, Tom is quite smart for his age. I'm sure there will be a master who will buy him and use him as a servant. The man's wife sobbed. If only the rice plants hadn't become sick. The poor farming couple who hadn't been able to harvest a sufficient amount of rice seemed to have decided that they had no choice but to sell their son. But then a miracle happened. Wait! Azen! You must not sell that child! A voice that the couple had heard before reached their ears. However, the voice was one that they had thought they would never hear again. It can't be, Ma! Azen, the husband, opened his eyes wide in shock. Standing before his eyes was his mother, whose corpse had been found in this year's summer, the day after she left to pick some wild plants. 
Her form was undefined and transparent, the wall behind her could be seen through her body. And mother-in-law? Azen screamed in terror. Please, rest in peace. You must not sell Tom. More importantly, you must tie the family's goats to the outside of the barn's door. And until the morning sun rises, you must keep all the windows closed and not step foot outside the house, the ghost of Azen's dead mother said to the couple who were trembling in fear. The goats? Azen repeated. Azen, listen to what your mother tells you, said the ghost. Listen to me. Leave your seats outside the barn's door. Wait inside the house and do not leave until the morning sun rises. If you do that, then something good. The goddess Vida's blessings will be upon you. Vivida, you say. Ma, didn't you convert to believe in all the Sama? Azen asked his mother. Without answering her son's question, Azen's mother's spirit quietly vanished without a trace. The couple stared blankly at the place where the spirit had appeared for a while before looking at each other and nodding. Mother-in-law did love Tom, didn't she? said Azen's wife. That's right. Those goats are soon going to be too old to squeeze any milk out of them anyway. Let's try believing in Ma, said Azen. Azen and his wife tied the goats to the barn's door and waited for morning as they had been instructed. When the sun rose, something astonishing had happened. This is... There was a person-sized doll made of clay standing on the spot where the sack of seeds had been. If Aizen and his wife had any knowledge of Japanese history, they would wonder what an earthen figure was doing here, but there was something that Aizen was even more concerned about. At the earthen figure's feet, there was a wooden club that he had never seen before. Thinking that he was meant to break the earthen figure open with it, he picked up the club and struck the earthen figure. The earthen figure easily split open, and boxes and bags filled with food and treasure fell out from inside, one after another. Salt, there's so much salt. There's enough for a year. And this one is wheat. These bottles are. There's even oil and vinegar. Honey, aren't these silver coins? There are even some gold coins mixed in with them. And this shiny thing here? Could it be a gemstone? The value of the food and treasures inside the earthen figure were dozens of times more than the pitiful amount that they would have gained by selling their only son. Not only would they not have to sell Tom, but they would easily survive the winter and have more than enough left over to buy new, young goats. Ah, oh, thank you, mother. Goddess Vida Sama, thank you very much. Azen cried. Dandelio, who was surrounded by earthen figure-shaped golems in a plain covered thickly in tall grass a little distance away from the village, was pleased with himself as he looked at the results of his actions. Goats, rabbits, seeds for southern rice, multiple kinds of beans that we don't have in Talashim, seeds and seedlings of fruits that aren't sold in the cities because they spoil easily, this is superb, he said to himself. Seeing how happy the farming families were, including Azen and his wife, Vandalyu did think that he could have taken a little more, but it wasn't a big problem. The ghosts of Hannah and the others who had been killed by Kanata had told him the locations of several poor farming villages in the Hartner Duchy, flew to them and gathered the spirits in order to secure the people he needed to negotiate. And through these spirits, which he had used visualization on to make them visible to normal people, he had offered his trades. There were several families who ignored the offers, but many villagers of the deeply religious farming villages had believed the spirits and accepted Vandalyu's trades. As a result, Vandalyu had gained a lot. There hadn't been any farming horses or cows that could help with work on the farms, but he had acquired several animals like goats and rabbits that could be raised just by feeding them grass, whose manure could be used as fertilizer. He had acquired the oldest animals in the trades, but there would be no problem if he used youth transformation on them. The items he had given in return had been things that he had acquired in dungeons or from bandits that he had encountered and exterminated along the way, so he didn't feel any loss from giving them away. I'm not in a social position where I can buy livestock and seeds normally. 
Vandalu wasn't the owner of a farm or a pasture, so he would stand out considerably if he tried to buy living livestock and seeds. That was why he was acquiring these through a method like this. Click 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 click. Pete, you mustn't eat those yet, said Vandalu, stopping Pete, who had extended half of his body from Vandalu's head towards one of the rabbits. We have to breed them properly first. Tomato stew with rabbit meat, garnished with goat milk cheese. It was the rabbits rather than Pete who had frozen in fear of Vandalia's unconcealed hunger as the earthen figure golems stored them inside their hollow bodies. Now then, let's move to the dungeon I created yesterday. I want a few more goats. Vandalia left the plane behind, followed by the earthen figure golems that were useful for transporting things. And then he repeated the same thing in several villages. With this, all kinds of livestock were introduced to Talashim. In addition, the goddess Vida's religion became more active in the Hartner Duchy's farming villages. A custom spread where the believers offered the crops harvested that year to dolls made of clay during harvest festivals, and then everyone would break the dolls the next day and take the broken pieces home with them as good luck charms. The members of the five colored blades sighed in frustration that their investigation was not going well. It's not going well after all, said Hines. You're right about that, said Edgar. Just where did she disappear to? The rumor that vampires can turn into fog is just a superstition, right? It's mostly just a superstition, said Diana. However, it is said that there were once vampires who possessed a unique skill to do so. Hines and his companions had been chasing after Eleonora, defeating vampires who would probably have information on her and questioning them, but no results were to be had. After she was seen in Nineland, there wasn't a single trace of Eleonora anywhere. The vampires that Heinz's party had defeated with Kinarp's information had known that Eleonora was a traitor, but hadn't known where she currently was or what she was doing. In fact, they had been surprised, wondering why Heinz and his party were looking for Eleonora. And since taking Chipras alive would have been an impossible task even for Heinz's party, they had only been able to question his underlings. They had tried finding someone with a spiritualist job to try and question Chipras, but no spiritualist had been able to communicate with the spirits of powerful vampires. From the limited information available, Heinz had concluded that the vampires had been instructed to report any sightings of Eleonora rather than having been instructed to look for her, and that Eleonora's master was considered to be an individual of far greater importance than Eleonora herself. This was because Ternicia and the other purebreed vampires had limited the information they provided to their underlings. As a result, rather than gaining information regarding Eleonora from the vampires, Heinz and his party had inadvertently informed Burkine that Eleonora had appeared in the Hartner Duchy. Unaware of this, they had continued searching, but they couldn't find any leads at all. Good grief, it really is strange. Even if noble-born vampires can fly, it's not like they can stay in the sky all day. So why can't we find any leads? Jennifer wondered. But both Eleonora and Vandalu were now outside the party search area of Niarchy and the Duchy's capital, so it was only natural that they couldn't find any leads. If Heinz's party had visited the cultivation villages to the south, they might have been able to learn of Vandalu and make the connection between him and Eleonora. But when the incident had occurred at the Slave Run Mine, they had been near Nineland, so they hadn't had the opportunity to visit the cultivation villages. Well, we were unable to find the criminal who undid the champion's seal and released the Demon King's fragment, but our actions were not in vain, said Diana. Not vain for us as adventurers, or vain in the fact that we are protecting Seelan. The five colored blades had defeated well over a hundred vampires, if including the subordinate vampires. They had even been acknowledged as saints by the Church of Alda. Their pockets were quite warm with the rewards they had received for defeating the vampires as well as the spoils of war taken from the vampires themselves. Heinz's promotion to S class was becoming a reality. The more the vampires' numbers were reduced by Heinz and his party, the safer the damper girl Seelan was. That was why their efforts hadn't been entirely pointless, but 
We should change the way we're conducting our search, said Hines. I think the fact that we have no leads whatsoever means that we've overlooked something. The party was now sitting in the Adventurers Guild, discussing how they should conduct their search. There had been a suggestion to see the ruins of the slave-run mine with their own eyes, despite having already seen the search report, and another suggestion to investigate other known locations of champion seals. However, they were completely oblivious to the conversation that was going on behind them. But even if they did notice it and were interested in its contents, they would have thought that it had nothing to do with their search. Did you hear? They apparently appeared in Yuta village as well, the goddesses Clay Dal Samus. By Clay Dal Samus, do you mean those rumors? Where the spirits of dead parents or siblings appear and tell you to offer your aged livestock and seeds outside in the middle of the night? And then when morning comes, there's a clay doll standing in their place with food and money inside? Yeah, those rumors. Geez, I wish I could get some of that luck. Can't they visit our house? But your parents and brothers? Yeah, they're alive. Grandpa and Grandma are still going strong, too. Then there's no way that the clay dolls will come, is there? And you're a shoemaker, aren't you? What are you planning to offer? Suppose you're right. Ha, huh, I went out and got nothing again. I went to exterminate some bandits to find that they'd all been killed by monsters and all of their treasure was gone as well. Maybe they had a fight amongst themselves or someone took revenge on them, all of their throats were slit. That was the work of a real pro. You as well? We didn't have any luck, either. Well, our prey was ghouls rather than bandits, though. The venom on their fangs can be used for medicine, and the manies of the males are selling for more these days because they make for good materials, but, for some reason, I haven't seen them around recently. I wonder if the slave traders hired someone to do it? I've heard the females sell for quite a lot when trained. Really? Those guys would have killed the males and taken their magic stones. But there weren't any male corpses left in the remains of the village. Hey, don't you smell something? I smell a conspiracy? I'm sure the many events that have been occurring recently are somehow connected in secret. I know this for sure. Roger, have you already had something to drink? Keep your drunk conspiracies under control. In truth, as the adventurer named Roger had said, these things were all connected, they were all the doing of Vandalieu and his companions. The goddess's clay dolls were obviously Vandalieu's work, but he had also conducted the extermination of the numerous bandit groups in passing, using them to gain bound coins as bargaining tools, improving his unarmed fighting technique skill and using them as prey to earn experience for Pete and the others. Listening to the spirits, he had frequently encountered evil bandits who had committed murder many times, so he had ended up annihilating the bandit groups one after another despite the fact that the Adventurers Guild would normally send extermination requests for them. And the fact that ghouls had been disappearing from the devil's nests of the Hartner Duchy was because Vandalieu had gone around inviting them to live in his nation after learning the locations of devil's nests where ghouls lived from the guild receptionist who had been killed by Kanata and from Luciliano who had previously worked as an adventurer. He had started doing this because it annoyed him that that the ghouls were being hunted by the adventurers of the Hartner Duchy, but the ghouls had fallen to their knees and bowed before him at the mere sight of him. It seemed that when ghouls saw Vandalio, they felt as if a god had descended upon them. His leveled-up death attribute charm skill as well as his ghoul king and holy son of Vita titles appeared to be doing their work. After that, all there was left to do was creating tiny-scale dungeons inside the devil's nests and using underhanded tricks to take them back to Talashim. The ghouls' leaders would have fistfights with Vigoro or compare their magic against Sidiriza's. Once they decided who was superior, they would obey Vigoro and Zadiris as well, so there were no problems after the ghouls' migration. But many of the ghouls had been unaware that their race had been created by Vida, and were very surprised to learn this truth. It seemed that living in isolated, individual devils' nests was a problem for the ghouls. Incidentally, it seemed that there were no villages of Vida's other races in the Hartner Duchy. 
There were apparently some in the former Sauron duchy, but the security around the national border was strict at the moment, so Bandelieu planned to sneak into the Sauron duchy to obtain rice seeds later when the security was more relaxed. And so, Bandelieu acquired some essentials, livestock and farming crops, and visited his mother's distant relatives, the ghouls who were created by the goddess Vida, just as he had told Kasim and his friends he would. Incidentally, while Heinz and his party were having their discussion, they learned that there were strange, small dungeons that were difficult to even call E-class recently appearing one after another in the Hartner duchy and decided to follow this trail. All of them were dungeons that Vandalieu had created with the labyrinth construction skill to use as a method of transport, abandoned after he was done using them. Heinz's party wasn't entirely off the mark, but they didn't gain anything from this either. Nobody but Vandalieu could teleport from dungeon to dungeon, after all. And around the start of winter, Vandalieu headed for the cultivation villages to make sure that they would get through the winter just fine. The equipment is packed, right? Everything is organized. All right, let's go. Karkin, who was mounted on horseback, left the city of Niarki with the unit under his command, Frodo, and two carriages of equipment. They initially headed north before leaving the highway to take a side road south. All in order to conceal their true destination and goal, which was to disguise themselves as bandits and attack the cultivation villages to the south.